so until this point in our uh, chemistry world, right, um, their discoveries were more, uh, scientific discoveries were really about finding what was out there, right? Discovering the elements themselves, um, and figuring out what what there was that we could even what there was that we could study. Um, so in the 1790s, they started becoming concerned with what we consider the quantitative nature of reactions, which means we're looking at what quantities go into chemical reactions and what quantities come out. So when we say quantitative nature, it means they wanted to start putting numbers to chemical reactions now. So they weren't just putting together and seeing what came out. Now they want to start putting numbers with them. So. Uh, these developed a certain um, kind of string of laws, okay? And so the first one was the law of conservation of mass. That should be a, a, a concept that we're pretty familiar with, right? If you had to tell me what the law of conservation of mass, can anyone raise your hand and tell me what the law of conservation of mass is? Yeah, Eric? Yeah, kind of, okay, close. Um, the explanation was right, yeah, but... Mass is neither created or destroyed during ordinary chemical reactions. It only changes form, okay, or it's transferred form. So we don't create mass and we don't destroy mass. So within a chemical reaction, mass is not created or destroyed. Okay, which is a really fancy word or a really fancy way to say you get out what you put in. Okay, uh huh. Okay, so the law of conservation of mass tells us that what we, what we put in is what we're going to get out. It might be in a different form, but the amount of mass we put in is exactly what we're going to get out. So this led to something called the law of definite proportions, and this might be one you haven't heard of. The law of definite proportions tells us a compound, a chemical compound, contains the same elements in the same proportions regardless of the size of the sample. And so this is a really fancy way to say H2O is always going to be two hydrogens and one oxygen. Right? Salt is always going to be one sodium and one chlorine. Okay, so that's, that's what the law of definite proportions tells us. Okay, once we've determined a chemical compound and its ratio, that ratio will be the same no matter any size of sample we draw it from or any source of sample. Okay, so like I said, it's a really fancy way of saying that water always has two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom. What are some other chemical compounds that we know? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, right, always has one carbon and two oxygens. Carbon monoxide always has one carbon and one oxygen. So once a chemical compound has been created, the law of definite proportions tells us that those proportions will remain the same whether our sample size is small or whether our sample size is large. And that should seem pretty intuitive to us. Okay. Sorry, do we have what we need here? All right, so law of multiple proportions has to be whole atoms. This should seem really simple to us, right? But do we ever see, okay, let's say if we're looking at water, it's H2O. So what's the ratio of hydrogen atoms to oxygen atoms? Two to one. So you don't ever see water written like this. Right? The ratio here is still two to one. But does it work like that? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Okay? In the same way, it doesn't work like this. H4O2. That's not water. That's a different compound. It does not behave the same as water. Although the ratio is the same... It doesn't work like that. So if I wanted to represent two water molecules, I would do it like this, 2H2O. Right? I put a coefficient in front, and that tells me I'm dealing with two molecules. If I just double the ratios, that means that it's a whole different compound. Okay? It behaves differently, it acts differently, all of that kind of stuff. So you can't just adjust these you don't adjust these super, the subscripts, right? Once a compound has been formed, it doesn't get adjusted. Okay? The way you change the quantity of it is we change by adding a coefficient. Okay? So the first guy we're talking about is a guy named John Dalton, and he proposed an explanation for these laws, okay, called Dalton's theories and Dalton's laws, okay? Um, 
So I'm going to kind of walk through Dalton's theory, and then I'm going to point out some differences we know today, because this was in 1808. Um, and so we know a few different things today. He was right for most of it, but there's a few things we know today. So I'm going to walk you through his theory, and then we'll talk about a couple different things we know today. So he said all matter is composed of atoms, and only whole numbers of atoms combine to form compounds. Would we agree with that? Yes. Right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we just talked about. Law of multiple proportion. Okay, so based on his law of multiple proportions, he, he gave this theory. Okay, to go along and help us understand that. Okay, and his theory, I, I think, seems a little simplistic for us at the beginning, but he said, all matter is composed of atoms. I'm going to put all this up here, and then I'll give you a little second to write, okay? Atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. Atoms of different elements differ in size, mass, and other properties. All matter is composed of atoms. And he has also said that all atoms of a given element are exactly the same size, exactly the same mass, and have exactly the same properties. So he's saying that every single oxygen atom has the same size, the same mass, the same properties. Would you agree with that? Right? That seems to be pretty agreeable, right? However, today we know something different. Okay, today we know that there are these things called isotopes. And isotopes of the same elements can have different masses. And we're going to dive into isotopes a little bit later. But an isotope is basically two versions of the same element. Two versions of the same element. They have different masses. So I want you to think about what this what this means. Let's break down what it what could change in an isotope. Okay? In order for two atoms to be considered the same element, what has to be the same? In order for two atoms to be of the same element, what has to be the same in both of those things? The number of not neutrons, but protons. What identifies the element? The only thing that identifies the element, right, is the number of protons. You change the number of protons, that means you change the element as a whole. Would you agree with that? Okay, so if they have different masses, what makes up an element's mass? Protons and neutrons. neutrons. So if they have differing masses, that means they have different number of neutrons. Right? They can't have different number of protons because that means they are now different elements. But if they have different masses, that means they have a differing number of neutrons. That is the reason that our atomic masses on the periodic table have decimal points. They're an average of all of these isotopes put together. And so we're going to look at that a little bit more in depth later um, tomorrow probably. But that's the reason that we have decimal points on our periodic table, right? Because you can't have a, a part of a neutron, right? The reason we have decimal points is that we've got an average going on of these different isotopes. Okay, so we'll look at that in a little while. Okay, he said atoms cannot be subdivided, destroyed, or created. This is Dalton's theory is what's written in black. But today, we know that we can create man-made elements. We know we can split atoms and that there are smaller parts to the atom, right? The proton the neutron, and the electron. Okay, so he said an atom is just a whole thing. Right? An atom is one thing, and it contains everything you need in that atom, and it's just oxygen or it's just hydrogen. We know today that we can split them, we can make atoms or elements, and that they're smaller parts. Okay. And then the other two parts to his theory still are true. Atoms of different elements can form, can combine in different ways. 
and then in chemical reactions we combine, separate, or rearrange our atoms. So those things are still true today. Um, so he came to this conclusion, if metals, which is most of the periodic table, right, if all metals give off this electric, uh, sorry, give off these electrons or have or contain these electrons, then that means that all of our elements have to contain electrons, okay? So he did a lot of experimentation and a lot of work that I'm not going to go into a whole lot, but he told us that the mass of the electron comes out to be this number, 9.103 times 10 to the negative 31st. Really, 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 really small. Okay. So small that we don't even consider it um, large enough to affect the mass of an atom, right? We don't determine the mass of the atom by adding protons plus neutrons plus electrons, right? Electrons have such a small mass that we don't even consider them uh, to have an effect on the mass of an atom. Okay, so really small. Okay, so what you need to know from this, right, the gist of this slide, J.J. Thompson, discover the electron. Here's the mass of it. Okay. So he came to this conclusion that said, if our atoms are neutral, which he understood they were, if atoms are neutral most of the time, and I have this thing that gives off an ele a negative charge, what has to be happening in order to make our atom neutral? There's got to be a positive charge that's offsetting that. Okay, so he understood that if we're giving off this negative charge, yet most of our atoms are neutral, there's got to be a positive there to offset that. Okay, and so he called them protons. Okay, so the electron discovery came first. Then he understood that something's got to be offsetting that negative charge, which is where our positively charged protons came from. Then he decided that since electrons have such little mass and protons aren't making up the mass of all of our atom, there's got to be something else in there that's contributing to the mass of our atom, okay, which would be the neutron. Okay, so he kind of took these stair steps uh, to get from electron to proton to neutron, right? This thought process of discovery. Um, we got to offset the negative charge with a positive. Then we have to take into consideration or make up for all of the rest of the mass in our atom. Okay. So this is what he thought the atom looked like. A positive charge, all these little negative charges kind of sprinkled around, and it was still kind of just a sphere. That's what he thought the atom looked like. Okay. Not what we think it looks like today. But that's what Thompson's model looked like. Have we heard of this guy at least? He has an atomic model that we'll look at too. Rutherford... Um, he, his experiments led to the discovery of the nucleus, okay, which we know is part of the atom. So in Thompson's model, he didn't really have the concept of a nucleus. He knew there was um, neutrons that contributed to the mass of the atom. He thought they were kind of sprinkled around. So Rutherford is going to discover the nucleus. And so what he did is he set up this um, gold foil, really thin. Gold is a metal, right? He set it up a really thin gold foil. And, and used a um, beam to send through what we call these alpha particles. And what an alpha particle is, is a positively charged particle that's four times heavier than hydrogen. Okay, so an alpha particle, uh, these are radioactive particles, and they um, have a mass that's four times heavier um, than hydrogen. Right, so they have an, an atomic mass of four. Okay. The important part there is that they are positively charged. Alpha particles are positively charged. That's really important in understanding how this experiment works. Okay, so he's got a foil sheet, a gold foil sheet, and he sends through all these positively charged particles. 
And he was expecting these particles to pass directly through. Because based on Thompson's model, which was just little neutral spheres, right, those positive charges wouldn't, they wouldn't affect it, right? They would just run right through the foil. Okay, so this was his ex expectation of what was happening in the experiment. That's what he thought would happen. They would just pass right through Thompson's model of the atom. Okay, do we see what's happening there? Thompson's model had just kind of a sphere with an overall positive charge with negative sprinkle that made it neutral. Okay, so he thought these, these positive charges would just pass right through. But that's what happened most of the time. Most of the time our alpha particles did go right through. Some of them, however, were redirected or bounced off as soon as they hit that gold foil. So I want you to just think about why that might have been the case. Okay, just like just sit and like think about that for a second. Okay. There's got to be some small positively charged area of the atom that's causing these alpha particles to redirect, right? What happens when a positive charge runs into a positive charge? They bounce off, right? Just like a magnet, right? If you put two wrong ends of a magnet together, they bounce off. So if a positively charged atom is being redirected, that means it's got to be hitting something that's positively charged. So his conclusion is that there's got to be a positively charged region within the atom that's causing these alpha particles to split, right, or to, to bounce off, not to split. Okay? He called this positively charged region the nucleus. Okay, does that... Um, experiment makes sense to everyone, right? They run through these positive atoms. It runs into something positive, which bounces it in a different direction. This theory of the, the atom is that the electrons orbited the nucleus, similar to the way planets orbit the sun. So his model looked like an orbit or like a planet, Okay, and so his model is nicknamed the planetary model. Okay, so the Rutherford model is also called the planetary model. And I have a picture of that that you can sketch if you want to. Okay, here's our source sending out the particles. Sends them to that gold foil. This is our screen that's picking up where those particles are deflected to. A vast majority of them went straight through. So a vast majority of them are hitting that empty space. But we see in this picture... Three of them, right, hit the nucleus, which deflected them. Okay, so it depends on where they hit the nucleus, all that kind of stuff. But three of them were able to hit that, that nucleus part. So that's what the Rutherford model, model now looks like, right? He understood that there's a, a positively charged region that's going to hit that. So this is his model of the atom. That's what the Rutherford model of the atom looks like. And this is what they call the planetary model because they think that he thinks that electrons are orbiting the nucleus, Okay, in these planetary type patterns. This is what I said is like kind of the commercialized version of the atom, right? We see this um, a, a lot, I feel like, in non-scientific, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a common model of the atom. Uh, it's not what we think today, but it gives us a, a, like an idea of what the nucleus and things look like. So he said, if there's an electron, right, maybe it's located here, and all the rest of this is empty space, right? So... That planetary model, he's saying, this is, this is the only path an electron can take, okay? And if it's located here, then all the rest of that line is just empty space. So that's why those, rather, that's why those alpha particles were just shooting right through, okay? So the Rutherford model is the planetary model. looks like this. The Thompson model was just that sphere that had positive charges. It's also, the Thompson model is also called the plum pudding model. Has anyone heard that version before? Plum pudding who knows why I think it looks like a bowl of plum pudding or something. I don't know. I didn't make up the name. I don't really know why it's called that, uh, but it is. I'm sure someone else could tell you a better story about why it's called that. But um, the Thompson model is a little sphere, right, with electrons sprinkled throughout the planetary model or the Rutherford model. And this says it looks like planets orbiting. Okay? So now we've gone from no nucleus at all, so now we know there's a nucleus, and so now let's figure out what's inside the nucleus. Okay, we're kind of building our way here. Today we know that the nucleus has two particles in it, two types of subatomic particles in it. What are they? Two 
Protons and neutrons. Okay? Protons and neutrons. Very good. Protons have a positive charge and a mass of 1 AMU. Neutrons have no charge and a mass of 1 AMU. So AMU stands for atomic mass unit. Okay. Protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have no charge at all. Both of which have a mass of 1 AMU. To keep them in a concentrated spot, it's not like they have like a little sack around them or anything. Like They just are held together by something called nuclear forces. We're not going to talk a whole lot about nuclear forces, um, but you should understand that they're not attracted to each other in the way that protons and electrons are attracted to each other. Right? It's not like an opposing charge that attracts them. It's something called these nuclear forces. And so that's above, above what we need to be doing at this point. But um, there's not like a little sack that holds them together. They're not oppositely charged, which attract them. Um, they're, they're held together by something called nuclear forces. Okay. All right. So now we're getting into, I think, what should be a familiar part. So the number of protons that an atom contains, that's what identifies a single element, right? Oxygen always has how many protons? Any idea? Eight. Eight protons. The atomic number is eight. So atomic number also identifies the number of protons in an atom, okay? So that's known as its atomic number. Number of protons, atomic number. We've talked about this just a little bit when we did our... Um, when we did our elements, right, 1 through 20. But atomic number is the number of protons. That number never, ever, ever changes, and it's always a whole number, right, because it's a whole number of protons. That number also tells us the number of electrons in the atom as long as the atom is neutral. Okay, or does not have a charge. Okay, so if I'm looking at oxygen and I know it has eight protons, that means a neutral oxygen atom also has how many electrons? Eight, right? Um, let's say, what if I had an oxygen, let's say I had oxygen with a negative two charge. How many electrons would that contain? Okay, just think for a second. If I had an oxygen atom with a charge of negative 2, okay, how many electrons do you think? Yeah, Nicole? 10 electrons, correct. How do we know it's 10 instead of 6? Right, what's this negative 2 charge tell us? Do we have more electrons than we need? or less electrons than we need. We have more electrons. A negative two charge is telling us we have two extra electrons, right? Because electrons have a negative charge. So if I have two extra electrons and a neutral one has eight, that should tell us we have 10 electrons in that atom. Is that making sense? Okay, so if I had an oxygen with a plus one charge, how many electrons would that contain? Seven, right? Plus one charge means I'm, I've lost an electron, right? It doesn't necessarily mean I have an extra proton because that means I'm in a different element, right? But it means I've lost one electron, okay? So I'm down, down to seven. Now. Okay, we'll go over that much more in depth later, but all right. We know that atoms of the same element always have the same number of protons. That should be given. You don't have to write that down again because we know all hydrogen atoms always have one proton. All oxygen atoms always have eight. But they can't have different number of neutrons. And so this is what we talked about um, earlier called isotopes. Okay. Isotopes are two elements of the same, two of the same elements that have different numbers of neutrons or different masses. Okay. So elements can have different masses, and that comes from having a different number of neutrons. Okay, and so those are called isotopes.
I just want you to be able to look at some atomic masses while we're talking here. So, elements um, have atoms with different numbers of neutrons or different masses. And so, some elements have only two isotopes. Some elements have three isotopes. Some elements have, I mean, they can get lots of isotopes or they can have very few. And so, what I want you to think about, when we calculate the atomic mass, and the atomic mass that's listed on your table is an average of the common isotopes of an, an element, okay? It's an average of the common isotopes of our element. So there are some elements that are really, really, really close to a whole number. Like, look at oxygen's atomic mass. What is it? 15.999, right? 15.99. So that means its most common isotope is probably what? 15 or 16? 16. 16. See how close that mass is to 16? That means its second most common isotope is probably what? 15 or 17? 15, right? Because we're, we, we didn't go to 16.001, we went to 15.999, right? So that, that's what I'm saying there is oxygen probably has two common isotopes, 16 by far the most common, 15 is probably the second most common. Does that kind of make sense? How you see the average happening there? Okay, what about, um, like, let's look at carbon. Same with carbon. Carbon is 12.011. What's probably the most common isotope for carbon? 12, right? Carbon 12, right? What's the second most common carbon? 13. Probably 13, right? Um, so you can think about that as you start to look at these atomic masses, is that you don't have part of a neutron. That's not why we have a, a decimal point here. It's an average of all of these isotopes, okay? Take a look at chlorine now. What's chlorine? 35.45. 35.45. That means it has two really pretty common isotopes, right? Chlorine 34 and chlorine 35. Because the average almost splits it down the middle. Does that kind of make sense? You mean 35 and 36? Um, I mean 35 and 36, sorry. 35.5. So, yes, 35 and 36. Okay? Does that make a little bit more sense? We're going to learn how this number is actually calculated. We're going to go through the calculations that go through that. But I want you to understand the process behind it first. So, that's what isotopes are. I, hydrogen has three isotopes, and they're common enough that they're named but they're obviously not so common to affect the atomic mass because the atomic mass of hydrogen is 1.008. So not, still not super abundant, okay? The, very, the most abundant version of hydrogen is H1, right? Only one proton, no neutrons at all. There is a hydrogen that exists with one neutron. It's called deuterium, okay? And we call this H2, okay? There's a third one that's called tritium, uh, it's not super common, but it has one proton, two neutrons. So you see as we look through the isotopes of hydrogen, the one thing that's not changing is its number of protons, right? Because if we try to change the mass by changing protons, what happens? It's a new element. Good, we changed the element. So if we added a proton to hydrogen, now it becomes helium, right? Helium, okay, because that's our next atomic number. All right, so we've, we've learned this before. Mass is protons plus neutrons. Um, and so this is something called our nuclear symbol, which has the chemical symbol, the mass number, and the atomic number all put together. You guys know how to read that on your periodic table? Okay, good. Okay. We've talked about this. I don't need to go over this too much. Okay, I want you to find, based on... This, this is a form of uh, uranium, and when it has this mass number written out beside that, means that's what isotope we're talking about. So uranium-235 means I'm talking about uranium with a mass of 235. Okay, that's a, a way of writing that. So we could write carbon-12, right? And that's telling you I'm talking about carbon with a mass of 12, not a carbon with a mass of 13, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to find the number of neutrons in uranium-235. Find the number of neutrons in uranium-235. So to do that, you've got to look up and find what's its mass number and what's its atomic number, right? 
Mass number is given. You've got to find out what's its atomic number from the periodic table. Okay, so I want you to find the number of neutrons. I also want you to find the number of electrons in a neutral uranium atom. And 92 for a neutral atom number of electrons. Okay, now what happens if we have different numbers of electrons than protons? These are uh, atoms are called ions. These atoms are called ions if we have different numbers of electrons than protons. Okay, so an ion is any atom that has a positive or a negative charge. So any charged particle is called an ion. Any charged particle is called an ion. Uh-huh. Hmm? An ion is a charged particle as a whole. Those are one's positive, one's negative. So you can only get an ion by adjusting, okay, let me rephrase that question. How, if I wanted to make a charged particle, what would I adjust, my protons or my electrons? Electrons. Electrons. So why can't I adjust my protons? Different element. Okay, has to be adjusted electrons. So um, if I have more electrons than protons, what type of charge would that give me? If I have more electrons than protons, is that going to give me a positive charge or a negative charge? Negative. negative. It's going to give me a negative charge, and that is called an anion. An anion is a negatively charged particle. Okay? And a negatively charged particle contains more electrons than protons. And I know that's really counterintuitive to say a negatively charged contains more protons. Usually we think negative means take away. Okay? But here we're thinking we have more of a negative charge, which would cause us to have an anion. Okay? More electrons than protons is called an anion. If we have fewer or less electrons than protons, that would give us what charge? It would give us what type of charge? A positive or a negative? A positive charge. And these are called cations. I wanted to describe lithium with one less electron than proton. How would I write that? Lithium with one less proton. What would its charge be if it's got one less proton? Sorry, one less electron than proton. Lithium plus one. Right, that's how I would describe that. If I've got one fewer electron than proton, I'd be lithium plus one. Okay. If I had oxygen with two extra electrons and protons, how would we write that? O minus 2. Right. That's, we, we did that example earlier. Okay. If we're writing our charges um, and it's a, a 1, either a plus or a minus 1, sometimes you'll see it just write it like, just like that, just with a plus. You can leave the 1 off. Uh, same with like chlorine is minus 1. Sometimes you'll see them just write a minus. Okay, If it's any number besides 1, you have to include the number. Right? So uh, beryllium plus 2 and sulfur minus 2. Right? So those are uh, the way you write the charge of this as a, not as an exponent necessarily, but as a superscript. Okay? Um, that's going to be where we stop today.